I'm here to talk about uh, the roadmap, the technical roadmap to solving aging entirely. And I ran a poll uh, just to see how many people at Edgemiles Edge actually want to solve aging. Uh, right now it's at 30%. It actually was at, uh, I think a few of you just answered, and this might be an audience enriched for people that want to live longer. So, uh, But it's at 30%, so that means 70% of people at Edge Esmeralda do want to die, uh, which is actually a lot, that's pretty good. I mean, if you ask the average person on the street, it's probably more like 95%, 99%, depending on where you go. Uh, so who am I? Uh, my name's Mark Hamelinen. Uh I've worked in biotech for about 20 years, Caltech, Cambridge, PhD dropout. Uh, series of biotech startups. Um, and now I run the Longevity Biotech Fellowship. So it's sort of an industry organization, but longevity is a big umbrella. And uh, we're the hardcore end. We're the ones that want to develop technology to solve aging entirely. Uh, we think you know public health measures and increasing life expectancy are really great. And people should try, try to take care of themselves, exercise, get a good sleep. That's all great. Um, but even if you do everything perfectly, you're still going to get old and you're still going to get you're still going to die. And the current paradigm uh, in medicine uh, doesn't uh, isn't really focused on solving that problem. And so we're we're an organization that focuses on that. It's a membership based organization. I also have a podcast uh, and I work with Vitalism. This is my co-founder, Nathan Chang. Uh, some of you guys might. He's more active on Twitter than me, so a little bit more famous. Uh, so yeah, the vision. Um, this is a outline of a roadmap that we're filling in in much more detail. But the the purpose of the roadmap is to go reverse engineer from this future imaginary future where lifespan of unlimited length is available to anybody that wants it. Like you can just be healthy for as long as you want. Um, that's the vision. So how do you work backwards from there? How did we get there in this imaginary, get to this imaginary future? Um, and I'll also just highlight that uh, as an organization, we view this as an urgent problem. Um, some people don't, but to me, this graph is very scary. Um, I'm like sort of about to turn 40, so I'm still on the flat part, but it's going to start going up pretty soon. Um, it's kind of like being in a bus heading towards a cliff and there's nobody in the driver's seat and everybody's just kind of arguing or playing games. And <laughs> I, I'd like to see some more people try to like figure out how we can turn the bus. And again, no amount of sauna, lifting, zone two, all the different health optimizations. They, they might square this curve a little bit but they won't change it by very much, unfortunately. Um, and what is the current state of things when it comes to aging? So when I got involved, uh, I started reading about gerontology when I was 13. Um, there were zero aging interventions at the time. Um, now it's like 27 years later, there's still zero aging <laughs> interventions. So the rate of progress is not very good. Uh, why is that? Uh, it's because biology is extremely complex. Um, I think it's really only in the last couple of years where we're starting to reach the point in terms of tools where we can start measuring and quantifying and building models of biology that are actually um, potentially useful for something as complex as aging. Um, and I say biology is extremely complex. Aging is actually more complex than biology because biology is sort of a generative algorithm that produces all these metabolic pathways which produce your body. Aging is all the stuff that's not coded for. It's all the byproducts, it's all the side effects, it's all the inefficiencies. Um, and it's oft, often stochastic and random. Um, and so it's actually, aging is potentially more complicated than biology and we still, don't even know what half of the genes do in the simplest bacteria like mycoplasma. Um, so I would say that aging is not a disease. People like to make 
the argument that aging is a disease, I think it's a very different beast. And if you think about it as a disease, if that's the paradigm, that's like the 20th century paradigm for um, medicine. Um, and we did cure a lot of things like in fact, various types of infections and acute diseases. Um, but aging is different. And so when you apply that sort of reductionist sort of thinking, like most of the things we've fixed are things that have simple single causes. Whereas aging is a network of tens of thousands of different things, hundreds of thousands of different things that all are all affecting each other. Um, so it's not, there's no like privileged causation. There's no silver bullet. There's no linear cause and effect. Uh, and that means that the reductionist approach that worked really well for 20, solving 21st century or 20th century problems doesn't work for aging. And another problem with aging is that if you don't fix all of it, you die at about the same time <laughs> because it's a bunch of things failing at about the same rate. So you can, again, you can try to like square that curve by you know, fixing diseases, which diseases are like the late stages of aging. Um, but yeah, if you, you know, cure people will say if you cured cancer, we'll only add like, I don't know, three to four years to average life expectancy, similar for any of the other diseases, because it just means another aspect of aging will kill you not too much later. So yeah, we have an outdated paradigm and we also have a lot of bottlenecks to progress. Um, so our organization ran a, um, survey of 400 professionals in the biotech field and asked them what the, their personal bottlenecks to progress were. And we summarized that. You can take a look at the study. It's uh, online in that QR code. Also, this whole deck is available on our website. Um, but lack of public data was number one. Um, we did this thing called the Human Genome Project. Uh, that was really amazing. Biology needs to do a lot more of that. All right, because what, where would be, we be without GenBank or the Protein Data Bank, right? So I'm actually gonna come back to the data problem. Uh, lack of biomarkers and models is another big problem. Right now, if you want to figure out if something affects aging, you have to do a lifespan study. And you can't do a lifespan study in humans because humans live really long. So that would be a very slow iteration time. So we use these short-lived things like mice, but the problem is mice die for very different reasons than we do. And so you find things that you try to translate it to humans and it doesn't work. Uh, maybe if you had biomarkers for aging and you like surrogate biomarkers like we have for say cardiovascular disease, we have biomarkers that are very good at predicting cardiovascular disease. If we had those for aging, you could do your trials based on those. We don't yet have a consensus on those, uh, but it's a very active field. And then of course, lack of funding. Uh, it, it's a very small field. Um, and I think there's a little bit of hype and wishful thinking recently. If you maybe follow someone like David Sinclair or uh, Andrew Huberman or any of the other, uh, I don't know, Peter Diamandis, you might think, oh, this is gonna be solved. No problem. Let's just look at these curves on these graphs, exponential progress. I mean, we don't have anything to worry about. Um, but again, like I said, we've gone from zero aging therapies to zero aging therapies over like the entire history of this field. Um, and even in mice, um, it turns out that most of the results that you hear about where they say they extended lifespan are in short-lived mice that are like inbred or fucked up somehow. And so all you're doing is normalizing their longevity. You're not actually extending the lifespan of a not fucked up mouse. If you have a high, if you put a higher bar on what would qualify as an aging intervention, um, there's actually only one thing that has ever extended most lifespan, and that's rapamycin, and not by very much. And there's good reason to suspect that it would have a smaller effect in humans. Plus, it has side effects that are not insignificant. Um, even calorie restriction actually doesn't make the bar <laughs> if you actually use, uh, if you look at all the different strains of mice, most mice actually have a shortened lifespan uh, when you put them on calorie restriction, not increased. 
And when people tried to do this in primates, uh, didn't reproduce. So unfortunately, calorie restriction even doesn't work. Um, so is there a plan for how we solve aging? Um, so we run an organization where we try to bring people into the industry and help them get to work on solving this problem. So we have to tell them what they should work on. And we looked at, you know, there's a lot of other people that have proposed plans. There's SENS, uh, the Foresight Tech Tree. A lot of different articles have been put out there. Um, I would say when it comes to the SENS hallmarks area, those are more just categorization systems of the existing literature. There's no reason to suspect that they're comprehensive. Nobody's ever done like a purely empirical look at what changes with age. Uh, we've just studied particular things, like a particular lab will specialize in say mitochondria in like, I don't know, muscle cells or cardiomyocytes or, or they might look at lysosomes and macrophages. And so we have all these like sort of, and, and people have categorized the results of all these different studies and created like the SENS or the Hallmarks approach um, but there's no reason to suspect that those are comprehensive and the list just keeps getting longer the more we study. So how, how long is it really? We don't actually know. Um, the Foresight Tech Tree is similarly just a categorization system of existing efforts, but it doesn't tell you any relative importance or like for any of them and it's kind of overwhelming to look at. Um, and then the articles that have come and gone, you know, people have published various roadmaps, but they're usually just a snapshot of a particular person or organizations, um, it, what they're most interested in at the moment. <laughs> so it, it's not comprehensive. So I would say there's no plan. This text, this just is a text version of what I just said. And do we need a plan? I think we do because right now, one of the reasons why the rate of progress is so slow is because People, even if you wanted to, to solve this problem, it's really unclear what you should do. Um, so we don't have a lot of talent moving into this industry, or when they do, they move into the sort of the not hardcore stuff, the easier stuff, like the health optimization stuff, because that's more clear. Um, there's no alignment or consensus, um, so we're not sort of distributing resources in any sort of rational manner. Um, and funders don't want to fund something if you don't have like a plausible sounding plan. I think when you go to rich people right now and you tell them that you want to work on aging, you're usually pitching your particular pet hypothesis and it usually sounds like bullshit. I mean, these people didn't get rich because they're, you know, they're, they're, they're they got rich because they're pretty smart and they can smell bullshit. So having like a plausible, credible plan, I think would all unlock a lot more funding. I mean, look at, uh, I won't, I won't name, name names. <laughs> so what kind of plan? So we wanted to build a plan that um, focuses only on paths to indefinite lifespan. So ignore all of the health span stuff entirely. Um, that, would just, that just narrows it down a lot. Um, we want well-defined objectives, uh, key technical milestones uh, on the path to indefinite lifespan. And we want it to be like actionable. We want a list of projects with time and cost estimates and how you can join, support, or invest, donate into them. Uh, so like I said, we did that survey of 400 people in the field. And part of the survey was asking people what they thought, uh, what approaches would give the most gains in terms of lifespan. And the only ones that people thought could solve aging entirely were these three. Um, so biostasis um, being the, the is usually reversible cryostasis. So that literally just means putting your biology on pause and then we wake you up when we've cured aging, right? Um, replacement is the idea that we know how to make young humans, you make a new human. So why don't we just replace, uh, we grow replacement young parts and just uh, do surgeries and replace your old parts with the young parts. Uh, that doesn't require you to understand the complexity of aging. And then the idea, and there's still the idea of advanced bioengineering. And this would be where you actually understand aging and then re-engineer humans to not age, in, age anymore. That is definitely the hardest one. 
um, but it actually is the, has the most activity. Um, and I don't think it's impossible. It's just very hard. Um, you can categorize these. So I've mentioned sort of um, advanced bioengineering requires you to understand aging. Um, replacement, the idea of just replacing parts, you don't have to understand aging. And likewise with biostasis, you don't have to uh, understand aging. Biostasis and traditional pharma are both methods of buying time. The nice thing about biostasis is it's an indefinite pause. If, you're, if you got somebody at liquid nitrogen temperatures, chemistry effectively is not proceeding, so you have an indefinite pause. Most of the activity in the field is over here, where in the best case scenario, you're just buying a few extra years. Uh, 10 years is like the optimistic case. And I'm friends with the CEOs of most of the longevity biotech companies and yeah, the optimistic estimate on their end is that we could add 10 years with pharmaceuticals. So yeah, why not pharma? Because it's just not up to the job of defeating aging. It's the 20th century model. It's the reductionist model. Um, and then of course, you can't talk about longevity without talking about AI. You can't talk about anything without talking about AI anymore. Uh, I would say that AI is a tool to make anything that you're doing go faster, and we should use it, just like we should use lab automation. Um, but that doesn't mean you stop doing biotech. It just means that you adopt the latest tools. And so we should use AI to make our progress faster. And even Sam Altman, uh, I think, agrees with me because he put $180 million into an aging biology company called Retro Biosciences. And I'm pretty sure he's going to be putting more in. So if you think that we can just sit back and wait for AI to solve the problem, um, Sam doesn't think so. Uh, I, he probably has a pretty good idea of uh, what to expect when it comes to AI. And one of the limiting factors with AI is data. So this might not be obvious to people. Um, we, when we uh, get applications to the Longevity Biotech Fellowship, a lot of them are from people from software or machine learning or AI backgrounds. And I ask them, like they're familiar with, uh, they're, everybody's familiar with AlphaFold, solving the protein folding problem. And I ask them, like how much do you think it costs to train the model? And they usually are, I guess, pretty close, which is about $20 million. And they usually say something between five and 20. Um, that's just in GPU, that's like the GPU time. Um, then I asked them, how much do you think that the, it costs to generate the data um, that um, you was used to train the model? And they usually guess something like 20, 30 million dollars. Um, it was actually 20 billion dollars. So over the course of like 30 years, governments spent 20 billion dollars on crystal structures for proteins. Um, and this is just to solve one very narrow problem in biology, right? Like this isn't building a systems model of biology or aging. This is one extremely narrow problem. The data set costs $20 billion. Um, so who's gonna pay for the data it would take to build a model of aging? Because it's gonna be a lot more. <laughs> I don't think people are fully aware of that. Um, the reprogramming industry is partially built on this thing called the Human Cell Atlas, which is being funded by Mark Zuckerberg. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Human and Genome Project costs $3 billion. The UK Biobank is the basis for um, pretty much most uh, longevity companies. They use that as their source of samples. Um, so basically, there's a massive, and, and this is, and we're nowhere near, like these are, these are just tiny starting points. Um, the amount of data we would actually need to build a model of aging um, is going to be probably in the trillions. Which is why I like to start with the one, the uh, approaches that don't require you to understand aging. Uh, because I'm not sure we're going to spend that trillion dollars in my lifetime. I hope we do, but I'm not sure we will. We certainly aren't doing that right now. Um, so biostasis, I already mentioned, is putting aging on pause. Uh, why do I put it at number one? Uh, <laughs> Some of you guys might know this person. She's uh, famous for uh, starting a longevity venture capital firm. 
she probably knows a lot about what's going on in the industry. And uh, she's, I think she started a cryo company that was publicly announced recently, so I feel like it's fair to put this slide up. Um, I know a couple other longevity biotech uh, CEOs that are planning to pivot to cryo. <laughs> <laughs> so, because they know how hard it is, right? Like they literally have grinded and burned themselves out trying to solve this problem, made zero progress, and they're like, well shit, I guess we should probably focus on cryo. Um, so yeah, the idea is to put you on indefinite pause by freezing you. Um, there are actual animals that can do this. There's like the Arctic tree frog, there's like some kind of squ Arctic squirrel. You can freeze them and thaw them and they're perfectly fine. So it's, there's natural examples. We know that it's possible. Like we don't actually know that it's possible to engineer a non-aging human, right? Like there's too many unknown unknowns. But we actually do know that this is possible. It's just an engineering problem. It's figuring out, reverse engineer, how did nature do it, and then do it to us. Or come up with, there's also a lot of proposals to do it with ways that are different than the way nature did it, that are using physics or chemistry checks that are different. And we should try all of those things. So here's a little overview of um, the different areas within Cryo, so preservation quality metrics, like right now, uh, you don't wanna have your, like, like with uh, trying to study lifespan, you don't want lifespan itself to be your quality metric because that just makes your iteration time on experiments too slow. You need uh, quality metrics that, like some kind of like mar biomarkers for um, how well did my preservation method work? Is it better than the other one? Like you need to be able to compare even if it didn't get the full solution. Um, so that's, an, uh, that's a difficult challenge. That's about measuring. Um, I'll mention also optimized cryoprotectants. People have started, there's a machine learning for uh, coming up with uh, generative algorithms for generating cryoprotectants. There's a couple people working on that. Rapid even, rapid even rewarming is probably um, the hardest part, uh, although you can potentially bypass it through cryobiology methods. So, when you don't evenly rewarm something, it's kind of like when you put something in a microwave and part of it's still frozen and part of it's hot. Like you, you don't want to do that to a human. Like that's not going to result in them being thawed and coming back to life. They're going to just be, uh, yeah, pretty dead. So you have to have rapid and even rewarming, and which is also actually a very hard problem. Um, but in biology, the Arctic frog doesn't get evenly rewarmed, and it's fine. So biology has actually solved this problem, um, and I think we should focus more on figuring out how biology did it. Now I have some hypotheses on that, but that gets, that's, that's the whole talk in itself. Um, and then while you're being stored, um, there's like methods to prevent cracking, um, so you have to have, control the temperature very precisely. Um, and there's some really cool progress on this recently. Uh, there's uh, some of you guys might have seen that article in the bottom left. I think that was was a New Scientist or MIT Technology Review. Uh, the um, uh, a rat kidney was frozen, taken out of a rat, frozen using a, a technique called nano warming to get the even rewarming. They flooded the kidney with these little nanoparticles that resonate in a certain EM frequency, and so they could. Um, basically heat up the kidney evenly throughout the entire kidney by just uh, vibrating these nanoparticles. Um, and so it was, yeah, and it worked. They put it back in the rat, kidney worked, it's totally fine. So the problem is with um, cryo, it becomes, most of the problems in cryo become exponentially harder with larger size. And the human brain or human is much larger than a rat kidney. So. It, in principle, but it needs to be scaled up. And there's a bunch of projects here. Uh, it's no longer called Lawrence Bio, that's Laura, Laura's got a company. Um, Tomorrow Biostasis in Europe is the big one. Um, and there's some new companies too. Oxford Cryotechnology is doing the machine learning for cryoprotectants. Um, I think Archive Sciences also. So there's a lot of startups in this area. It's actually started to become a little bit more trendy, but it's still pretty niche. Um, the interesting thing about it, though, is that to test all of the plausible things 
Um, there's a roadmap that we've been putting together and the details will be uh, published soon. But it would probably only cost about $1.5 billion uh, to test all of the plausible things that we think might work. And there's a pretty good chance that that would solve the problem. Like we would actually have reversible chiostasis at the end of that. Um, I would probably apply the rule of pi because then if anyone who's ever done an engineering project knows that you know things take longer and are more expensive than you expect. So maybe it's the multiply that by 3.14. Okay, so next up, replacement. Replacing old parts with young. Um, the, some of you guys might have went to Laura's uh, session on Friday. Um, they were talking about replacement too. They were mostly talking about cell and tissue replacement, uh, which is very, it's, that's an industry that's existed for a long time. We call it regenerative medicine, cell therapies, um, trying to grow, you know, 3D print kidneys or something like that. People have been trying to do this for a long time and they've only managed to do very simple structures when it comes to growing body parts outside of the body. And there's a reason for that. Um, your organs are all designed to work together, right? Like if I took one of your organs out, how long would you live, right? But then also how long would that organ live by itself? <laughs> Not very long, right? Like there, this body of ours is a system that's designed to work together. And to try to synthetically replicate that and grow a, an individual organ without the whole body is actually technically extremely challenging. Uh, more also try to, trying to like manufacture an organ without going through the developmental process. So, I mean, we, we make organs when we make a new human, but that's like done, biology has figured that out. It's an algorithmic process. Um, so try to, to try to replicate that with some other method like 3D printing. Uh, it's very technically challenging. But there's an easier path, um, which is instead of trying to grow a kidney without a body, just grow a whole body. And then you get the kidneys, but you also have the whole body. Um, so you can grow a clone of yourself, uh, a non-sentient clone. That's the key part of this. So there's a natural example of this. There are, there's the condition called hydra anencephaly, where people are born without a, cor without a cortex. And so you know, some of these people, like they didn't, they're not conscious. They don't have the part of the brain that we attribute to memory, personality, emotions, any of that stuff. So they, it's just a body. Um, and some of these people have been kept on life support systems uh, for like 30 years and their body just grows and develops, but doesn't have a mind. Um, so we can actually replicate that process. We can make a clone of you that doesn't have a, um, a functioning mind. It's non-sentient, uh, so it's just meat. Um, and then we could transplant either your head or your brain into this brand new young body. And then by definition, everything you've replaced is young. Great, that's so convenient. Uh, but then there's the brain. Um, so Jean Hebert gave a more detailed talk on this, and I recommend watching um, his talks on YouTube. Uh, but you can actually replace the brain gradually, and I'll just very briefly explain why, that, why we think that's the case. Um, people often get benign tumors in their brain that grow slowly, and they don't even know that they have a tumor until they go get an MRI for some other reason. And then it, they just notice, oh, you have a tumor in your brain. But they didn't, they, from the outside, they seem fine. Like the entire language center or the entire visual cortex can be obliterated by this tumor. But what happens is that the functions migrate to other parts of the brain. So also the brain is shrinking as you age. So it's, there's actually space being made for new tissue. So by a combination of doing um, gradual silencing of parts of the brain slowly enough that function can migrate and just filling in the empty space that's being created as the brain is shrinking, you can just add new tissue to the brain. And if you just do this periodically over time, you'll just end up with a fresh brain where like all is shipothesis, right? At some point, like none of the old cells are still there anymore, but it's fine. You're still you. Um, there are technical challenges though. Uh, nerve reconnection, most people are probably familiar with that because of spinal cord injury. Um, but there's actually been some pretty 
uh, impressive progress there using brain computer interfaces and also using uh, cellular reprogramming to uh, reconnect nerves. So David Sinclair's lab has done some work on re re uh, fixing injured optic nerves using reprogramming. And there's a couple of companies that do brain computer interfaces where you could actually use that to do the nerve reconnection. Um, then uh, you need to be able to obviously produce the bodies and make sure that they are definitely non-sentient. Um, and yeah, and then you need to, for the brain in particular, you need to be able to build, you need to be able to build graft tissue of all the different types of tissue in the brain and actually develop surgical methods for doing those replacements. And a lot of that work has been done in animals and is very promising. So yeah, like I said, this is an area, the cloning, the, um, we've done cloning in, uh, I think, monkeys now. There's no reason to expect we couldn't do it in humans. We know the genes involved in producing non-sentient um, clones. Um, and there's been a lot of work done by Jean and other people on doing tissue replacement in the brain. Um, so it's quite promising. And there's a new wave of startups here. So only two of them are actually public, BE Therapeutics and Renewal Bio. Uh, Renewal Bio is working on the generating all the cell types that you need in order to build the tissue grafts. Uh, BE Therapeutics is working on doing cortical tissue grafting, uh, initially going after strokes. Um, but then all the people that are working on the cloned bodies, um, they are stealth. Um, they don't want the media attention for fairly obvious reasons. Um, I think there was some movie called The Island recently about clones being harvested for organs. Of course, the media is going to love to hate on this, but um, so there's just no advantage for them being public. Um, and there's actually a company working on what's called the brain jar approach, which is instead of using a body to keep the brain alive, you just keep the brain alive in like a vat connected to a brain computer interface and, a and, and then it could be controlling a prosthetic body. Um, that's an interesting alternative and worth including because there's not really any reason to suspect that we couldn't make that work. It's, I think, a little bit harder in the sense that the best way to keep a brain alive is for the brain to be in a body. <laughs> like, we know that works. We don't know for sure that we can do it without the body. Um, so there's a lot of science there. Uh, but in principle, you could probably, it's like hydroponics, right? Like, instead of putting a plant in the ground, you put it in hydroponics. You could put the brain in a system that just keeps it alive. And there's a roadmap for this uh, to test this in um, primates would probably cost about $3.6 billion, and you can see if it worked. Um, this would be involving doing the uh, head or brain transplantation and uh, the gradual brain replacement. So we could test this. Uh, and again, the amount of money is actually not that big, um, but it probably rounded up to $10 billion with the rule of pi again. So yeah, replacement, uh, in summary, it's an engineering approach to aging that bypasses needing to understand aging, uh, which is really convenient because aging is extremely complex and it's gonna be very expensive to figure it out and to design interventions for it. So I think this is a really, both cryo and replacement are super important. But we have to talk about bioengineering uh, because ultimately uh, any, Anything that replacement doesn't fix, like we, it might not be a complete solution for some reason or another. And so we might end up having to do the bioengineering anyways. Um, and hey, if you're gonna make a new cloned body, why don't you give it some genetic upgrades so it like lasts longer? And why don't you do some uh, treatments to the brain so that you don't have to do surgeries as frequently? Because surgeries are like unpleasant, have risks associated with them. So why don't we try to rejuvenate the brain as much as we can and without surgery? Um, so there's a lot of good reasons to do bioengineering. Um, and by bioengineering, I generally mean software updates, like actually updating your genetics. Um, that's just what I said. So there's kind of four main verticals within bioengineering. There's data collection, which means like characterization of biology and aging. There's building models. There's designing interventions. And then there's delivering those interventions to the body. Uh, they're all extremely hard problems. Um, I'll highlight a few of them. Um, 
exhaustive com comparative biology, I think, is probably underrated. There's only like two labs in the world that work on this, uh, a couple postdocs underfunded. But there's been a couple of really promising examples here. So each of the different branches of the evolutionary tree um, has large variety in lifespan, right? Like within rodents, there's everything from mice to naked mole rats. There's, there's 10 to 200 fold variation in lifespan within, within closely related species on different branches of the evolutionary tree. And so we can do, you know, multi-omic analysis and figure out what's different. And then we can identify the mechanisms. And it turns out that different branches have used different mechanisms to achieve longevity. Uh, so they don't do it necessarily the same as we do. And so if you mix and match all of those adaptations into one organism, maybe hopefully us, maybe our dogs too, I'd like my dog to live longer, uh, then maybe you could extend lifespan quite a bit. And so two examples, uh, elephants have extra copies of tumor gatekeeper suppressor genes. Um, for us, we just have two copies of P53. I think elephants have 30 copies. Um, in order for a tumor to be successful, it needs to delete that gene or mutate that gene. If you have two copies, statistically, that's going to happen at some point, just one of your cells. Uh, if you have 30 copies, statistically, it's probably not going to happen in your lifetime. And this turns out, if you add extra copies of P53 to mice, they get less cancer. It just works. So um, there's also a, when you look at uh, rodents, naked mole rats have this modified extracellular matrix um, uh, component. Um, that sort of it creates a cage that prevents cancers from growing. Uh, basically, cancers can't expand outside of this cage, and so they basically die. They kill themselves when they try to divide, and they can't. Um, and if you put that into other rodents, it actually reduces the cancer they get, the rate of cancer they get. So we've barely scratched the surface on how um, various species have achieved longevity, and we should be exhaustively studying that. And right now, like I said, there's like, I don't know, maybe a dozen postdocs in the world that work on this. It's, it's very niche. Um, yeah, so data collection, modeling, design, delivery. There's a lot of activity in all of these areas, uh, especially modeling right now is really trendy. Um, and a lot of projects, too. This is the area that's getting the most funding. Um, so. Again, and these, these slides are online, so you're, you can check them later. No worries. We'll take, take photos if you want. Um, and when you advance down these sort of verticals, which I put horizontal here, ironically, um, you get like intermediate levels of progress, right? So it's not like you have to go to the full solution to Asian immediately. You can maybe buy time and buy a little more time and buy a little more time and eventually you reach this like escape velocity concept where you're adding years to life faster than you're aging. Um, so I am going to highlight a few of the specific challenges though. And yeah, so I already mentioned data, so I'm not going to go over that again, but I'm going to mention like sort of what a solution might look like. So I mentioned the SENS and the hallmarks of aging are basically just categorization systems, and we don't actually know all of what aging is. Um, part of that is it's the way we do science right now. You do like, a, you get a small grant, you study like uh, some particular aspect of biology, and then you write a paper on it, and then you move on to your next thing, project, and probably it wasn't even reproducible most of the time. Um, but sometimes we do big projects like the Human Genome Project. Um, and I would suggest that if we want to empirically understand what aging is, we go in with no hypothesis at all. We do this purely empirically. And a uh, potentially crazy idea, but one that has actually been proposed and could work, is you actually just image samples of tissue at atomic resolution. So you don't like, try to s pretend that you understand how biology works with your stories and your narratives and your diagrams. You just image, you take like sam samples of every different type of tissue from people of every different age, of diverse uh, backgrounds genetically, and you take little cubes that are flash frozen and you drop them into an x-ray laser and you get a, a scatter plot, single particle analysis, the specific position of every atom 
in that sample, and you just do millions of these samples, billions of these samples, and then you just train machine learning algorithms to figure out what are the differences between people that are old, young, diseased, not diseased. Um, you don't go in with any hypothesis at all. So this is the way I would do it. If I was the uh, NSF or the NIH, I'd be building a giant X-ray laser, 10 times the size of the one at Stanford. They, did, uh, they imaged an uh, entire virus particle. But if you made a bigger one, you could image a cell. Uh, delivery is another big problem. So right now, the state of the art is quite terrible, at least with respect to aging. You can solve certain problems uh, with the current delivery mechanisms. The uh, mRNA vaccines were transient gene delivery. Uh, don't tell anybody. They're going to lose their minds. Don't tell the public. But um, yeah, right now, the state of the art is like kind of throwing a bucket of paint in the air and expecting the paint to land evenly on every grain of sand on the beach. Like that's, that's, you're injecting like a virus or something and obviously the, near the site of injection you get a much higher dose and then it gets into the blood and then the liver tries to filter most of it out and then, yeah, so you just, and also there's just topologically the inside of your body is complicated, right? Some cells are very close to the capillaries, some are far away. Um, then there's the blood brain barrier and there's like some, some things are, there's the lymphatic system, like it's just really, topologically complicated and to try to just like inject something and hope that every cell gets one copy of it is kind of crazy to think that you could do that. Um, so I think we need, uh, and that's the way all current methods work actually. Um, so I think we need non-incrementalist approaches. We need completely different ideas when it comes to gene delivery if we're going to do the software updates, because what you're going to need is literally thousands of genetic modifications to every cell in your body if you want to cure aging. Um, and so the, the current state of the art is very far away from that. What, what might a solution look like? Um, there's a lot of interesting proposals out there. Um, you can imagine there's things called intracellular parasites. They actually are uh, like little bacteria, and they can move, in, they can live in your cell. Uh, we have things called mitochondria. They are, were, were originally uh, free-living bacteria. Um, you can imagine modifying an intracellular parasite to just do what you want it to do, and it could just be like a novel uh, de novo uh, engineered organelle, uh, like a mitochondria, except that we designed it, and it goes in there and it fixes things. Um, another way is to install a back door. So we're specifically designed to resist being genetically modified, right? Like viruses are trying to genetically modify our cell, us all the time because that's how they reproduce. And so we have like really complicated systems in place to prevent ourselves from being genetically modified. But you can install a backdoor, which means that there's a mechanism. So you install a way of, of doing the updates. Um, of course, that introduces like maybe some biosecurity concepts, but each person could have a unique key to that back door. could be based on sequence. Uh, and so there's these things called safe harbor sites. There are specific sites in our genomes. There's a few of them that where there's no active genes, so inserting something there doesn't damage anything. Um, and you can consume them in a way that destroys them so that every cell only gets one copy of a modification. And you would install the back door, which would be a complicated that you would install the um, mechanism for, for uh, creating the backdoor in those sites. And so then every cell would get a backdoor. And the exact way you would build that is, and again, probably like a full length presentation. So if anybody is interested in that idea, come talk to me afterwards. Um, models. So yeah, so we have to. If we're going to design interventions, we need to have models of biology. Um, that's how we get the biomarkers. That's how we learn. Like, so like the biomarkers and the models kind of go hand in hand, because if you want to measure the state of somebody's health, you actually can't just like measure one biomarker. Like, like that's just not going to do it. It's not going to break down to a unidimensional thing. You have to have a model of biology and aging, and then be able to measure 
a, a, probably a, a large number of biomarkers and then see where that person fits into the model and what their trajectory is, whether they're like on the path to diseases or death or whether they're actually stable. Um, and then that model is the thing that you use to you uh, come up with ideas for how do we improve the person's biology uh, and then you test those. Um, and there's like, some pretty good progress on this. Like we've designed enzymes using uh, generative models now that like do specific things, have specific activities. And we've also uh, discovered all kinds of enzymes and designed modifications of them that are better. Like the original Cas9 protein, people don't really use that anymore. They use these like much improved versions of it that we've used uh, machine learning and other tools to improve, to make them better. Um, and the sort of holy grail would be full actual physics simulations of cells, because then you could just do experiments by having giant rooms full of servers. Um, this is something that is foreseeable. Um, you can see graphs of like when we expect to have enough computational power to do this. Uh, it's probably not to like 2045, but there might be heuristics and uh, ways of uh, abstracting away some of the complexity that allows you to achieve useful models sooner than that. Um, and then I gave you guys time and cost estimates for cryo and for uh, replacement. Uh, the problem is you can't do that for um, the bioengineering approach because like I said, we don't even know all of what aging is yet. So how could you make a plan for solving all of it? Uh, what we can do is come up with some estimates for how much it would cost to develop certain specific tools and capabilities, and that will be part of the next version of this roadmap. But optimistic na napkin math uh, by people in the field that we, in our survey is like, if you were spending a trillion dollars per year over 25 years, you might make some significant progress. We're not spending anywhere near that. Uh, yeah, so where are we? Yeah, I said we're not spending that much, so what are we doing right now? Uh, the NIH allocates less than half a percentage of its budget to aging biology. Um, longevity is less than 1% of biotech valuations, and most of that is on stuff that is, I would say, not very interesting. It's very low impact in the best case scenario, and less than 3% of biotech startup funding. So aging is obviously not a priority right now. Most people are focused on other things. Um, I think for VCs, there's specific reasons for that. They need to get ROI. Their LPs are expecting them to get them a return on their investment. Uh, people that are trying to do the solve the hard research problems are less attractive than the people doing food delivery services or whatever other trendy thing. Um, you might think the billionaires are spending a lot of money on this, especially if you read the news, because like you know you see these articles about like oh Jeff Bezos put in billions of dollars. And actually, it turns out billionaires are not doing anything about this. Billionaires aren't any different than the average person. They don't seem any more interested in extending lifespan than anybody else. Uh, they might even be less interested for some reason. I think you get to be a billionaire because you're really good and really sort of maybe even addicted to making money. And solving aging is probably not the best way to, it's probably a good way to lose your money. It's not a good way to make money. Um, so uh, yeah, unfortunately, although Warren Buffett said that he would give all his money to be 29 again, he hasn't spent a single dime on longevity. And that's true of uh, like 99% of the billionaires. Uh, so how, but money is being spent. We have industries out there and this is a comparison. Red is showing the uh, amount of money that is spent annually in an area. And blue is showing what's the expected lifespan return. So, and the number is in billions or in years. Um, so you might notice here, uh, pharma, this, the scale of this graph actually only goes to 100, and pharma would be at 250. So we would need a much larger graph, but then you wouldn't really be able to see anything at the bottom of the graph. So almost all the money is going into the 20th century model of doing medicine, which is not really appropriate for aging. Uh, it's just not gonna achieve much. We already know that. Uh, even the people working on it know that. Um, the areas that I mentioned, replacement, cryo, 
and advanced bioengineering. Um, so this is bioengineering as a whole, but most of that is focused on diseases not aging um, or not the type of tool development that we need for aging. So there's basically an inverse relationship between the potential impact on lifespan that a, a, an area would get and how much money it receives right now. So that's, that's the way our society is treating this. And actually, these lines are just placeholders. Um, they wouldn't even get a pixel if I made this accurate. <laughs> um, so in summary, aging, I would say, is an urgent problem. It's the primary cause of death and suffering. Uh, there are no therapies for aging yet. There is some growing interest, but most of it's in sort of near-term, modest uh, approaches that obviously won't solve aging. We know that. Um, and there's an inverse relationship between the funding level and the potential impact of a technology path, which is basically insane um, if you care about aging, which obviously indicates that most people don't. Um, or they just haven't looked into this. Uh, and there are many paths forward, though. Uh, we just need talent and capital allocated towards them, and then we could actually make progress. So if anybody here has money and wants to invest in things that could actually solve aging, we know what those things are. Um, they need money. Um, and if you actually ask the people that work, like the scientists and the engineers that actually do the work in the industry, not the people with money, but the actual people that do the work, ask them how they would allocate spending, it's basically the inverse of what currently is the situation. So it's not actually, the problem is that it's really hard to get paid to actually work on the things that could solve aging. The people with the money don't seem to be interested in it, but the scientists and the engineers actually know what's up. Um, so almost over here, what would a paradigm look like where we do solve aging um, in my lifetime and the lifetime of many of you? I think it would be something where we had dozens of um, rescale institute, research institutes. Uh, so the VIS Institute is, uh, does synthetic biology and genomics. They're in Harvard. Uh, basically, some billionaire decided to donate all of his money, and it, uh, it's basically a large portion of our modern synthetic biology tool set and, and genomics tool set come from this one institute. If we had dozens of those in aging, and then also dozens of SpaceX scale projects to deploy those, uh, the things that are developed in those institutes, then I think we could solve this in our lifetime. Right now we don't have, we have zero on both sides. Um, so yeah, I'll just say, don't wait. Um, all these billionaires, I don't know what they think. They spend hundreds of millions of dollars on their yachts. Don't seem interested in aging. Um, <laughs> So I, I really think that there, we need to have a more of a sense of urgency and pr a higher priority on this problem. Um, you can uh, join, if you want to get it to work on this, you can join the Longevity Biotech Fellowship. We help find the overlap between your skill set and the work that needs to be done and make sure you have an impactful career. Uh, we're raising a fund. Uh, or just do it yourself or copy what I'm doing. Copy my slides if you want. Go give my pitch to somebody else. I don't care. As long as this work gets done, that's all I care about. Um, and we also have a podcast, so you can follow up the podcast to stay updated. And that's it. That's my talk. Thank you.